Uh, good afternoon. The first item of business this afternoon. Uh, point of order, Christine Graham. Deputy Presiding Officer, events over the last week have been unprecedented. The UK Government's decision to invoke a Section 35 order in response to this Parliament overwhelmingly passing the Gender Recognition Reform Bill in December raises serious questions about devolution, which I believe should be of huge concern to every member serving the Scottish people in this, in this institution. Furthermore, the concerns in this matter have been further amplified in recent days given the UK Government, namely Alistair Jack and Kemi Badenoch, refusing three invitations to appear before Scottish Parliament committees to explain their extraordinary use of a Section 35 order to block a bill defined within the clear powers and responsibilities of this Parliament. In light of this, and under Rule 12.4 of Standing Orders, referencing Section 23 of the Scotland Act 1998, I'd like to ask you, Presiding Officer, what can be done to ensure the UK Government respects this Parliament, the devolved powers of it, and the legislation we pass so that Parliament holds the UK Government accountable for blocking the passing of devolved law, as I've said, overwhelmingly supported across parties in the Chamber? Uh, thank you, Ms Graham, and, and I would thank you, Ms Graham, uh, for advanced notice of the point of order. I would observe that in the first instance, I know the, the letters have been sent out. Uh, by the committees and I have noted the, the responses. I think in the first instance it's a matter for the committees themselves to decide how they wish to proceed uh, in eliciting the information uh, that they are looking for and I, I don't think there's an awful lot more I can add uh, at this stage. Uh, we now need to progress with portfolio questions. The first portfolio this afternoon is Rural Affairs and Islands. Uh, I would invite any members wishing to ask a supplementary to press the request to speak buttons during the relevant questions. Uh, as ever, there's quite a bit of interest, so the usual plea for brief questions and brief responses wherever possible. I will try to police that as lightly um, as, uh, as is necessary. I call question number one, Fiona Hislop to ask the Scottish Government regarding any impact on Scottish agriculture, what its most recent assessment is of the UK-New Zealand Free Trade Agreement. Cabinet Secretary. The UK Government's own economic modelling for the New Zealand deal shows agriculture and semi-processing sectors will be losing sectors. And the former UK uh, Government Secretary of State for Environment, Food and Rural Affairs shares our view that this and the Australia deals are not very good deals for the UK. Scottish farmers have also been very clear that this trade deal, which provides New Zealand exporters unfettered access to the UK market, despite operating to lower cost and regulatory standards, will undercut domestic agri-food producers and put jobs and the rural economy at risk. The outcome is also in stark contrast to the recently negotiated EU-New Zealand trade deal, which better protects their agri-food sector, reinforcing that the best place for Scotland is within the EU. Fiona Hislop. Uh, can I perhaps uh, preface my next question by paying tribute to Scotland's most famous uh, farmer and poet, Robert Burns, on this 25th of January, his birthday. But can I ask, is the Cabinet Secretary aware that Conservatives Lord Hannan of Kingslayer and UK Government Minister for International Trade Lord Johnston of Lainston both stated during a House of Lords debate that New Zealand lamb was better for the environment than home-produced lamb? Does she agree that this is not only wrong uh, and an insult to Scotland's farmers who work extremely hard to provide a product of internationally renowned quality and just demonstrates the continuing failure of the Conservative Party to defend and safeguard the interests of Scottish farmers. Cabinet Secretary. The member is absolutely right in what she's saying because we know that there have been a, a catalogue of failures to protect the interests of Scottish farmers, whether that's from Brexit. We've also seen the abject failure of the UK government to secure trade deals that actually protect our agri-food sector too. And trade deals that, as I said in my initial response, that the former UK Secretary of State, who was in post during the, nego the negotiation of those agreements, has now also criticised now that he is no longer in that place. Uh, I also couldn't disagree more with the comments that were made during that Lords debate. 
Scotch lamb is produced to some of the highest standards anywhere in the world. But even looking beyond the quality itself, when we look to the wider production and supply chain, it supports jobs right throughout our, our rural communities and economy. And by eating Scotch lamb, we're supporting our local producers rather than consuming a product which has been shipped halfway around the world with the obvious climate impact that that has. Question number two, Brian Whittle. Thank you, Deputy Bering Officer. To ask the Scottish Government what consideration it has given to how the Blue Economy vision for Scotland can support developing industries, and industries within the Blue Economy in the drive to net zero. Cabinet Secretary. The Blue Economy vision represents a long term strategy that serves as an overall framework for marine policies and actions. We have committed to mainstreaming a blue economy approach so that policies and decision makers have that clear alignment with this vision. So, for example, the blue economy vision is at the heart of the Marine Fund Scotland, through which we are providing £14 million annually in grant funding to a range of sectors who support Scotland's net zero commitments. This protects and creates jobs in Scotland's coastal communities, and it supports those local supply chains and industries to adapt as well as to look to invest for the future. Brian Whittle. Thank the Cabinet Secretary for that answer. The value of natural capital is referenced across many of the Scottish Government's policies and strategies, including their Blue Economy vision and Scotland's Blue Economy approach paper. But if we are to deliver a good policy that benefits Scotland's natural capital, we must have a complete understanding of what we have. Currently, there is a significant knowledge gap as Nature Scott's Natural Capital Asset Index does not include marine habitats, citing a lack of available data as a reason for the exclusion. So, given how vital uh, good data is to good policy, can the Minister explain how the Scottish Government proposed to improve the quality and quantity of their data gathering? Cabinet Secretary. I think this is something we're always looking to see where we can improve and what other information we can gather because obviously when we are taking decisions we want to base that on the best available science and data that we have. Unfortunately when it comes to the marine environment I mean the area is vast and even with all the resources at our hand it would be uh, nigh on impossible to be able to, to map out all the assets that we would want to do as well as to gather all the science and data that we have. I mean that's why we've also set out a number of policies as to how best we adapt to that, how we develop policy in the absence of, of science and available data, as well as setting out how we intend to work to try and improve that where we possibly can. And I think an important element of that is looking towards collaboration. How can we work with our stakeholders, with industry, uh, as well as with uh, uh, academic institutions as well, to try and really build that science and evidence base? And briefly, Willie Rennie. Uh, the Blue Economy paper states will consult on applying a cap to the fishing activity in inshore waters that will limit activity to current levels and set a ceiling from which activities that disrupt the seabed can be reduced in the light of evidence that becomes available. Why are we only using evidence to reduce activity? Why are we not following wherever the evidence takes us, even that, if that means an increase in inshore fisheries activity? Cabinet Secretary. Again, this follows on from Brian Whittle's point, and I think the, the point that the member makes is an important one about that, gathering that data and gathering that evidence as well. I am not going to, to prejudge the outcome of any consultation that we will be setting out, because of course we will be looking to set out more information and have more engagement on those policies in due course. But I would be happy to discuss this further with, uh, with the member uh, as, that, uh, as we look to launch that consultation and as this policy continues to develop. Question number three from Sanders Kulhani, who joins us remotely. So I've asked the Scottish Government whether it will provide an update on avian flu, including any measures it is taking to tackle its spread. Cabinet Secretary. Since the start of October 2022, there have been 18 confirmed cases of highly pathogenic avian influenza H5N1 in poultry and captive birds, and 81 findings in wild birds in Scotland. The Scottish Government responded to the risk of avian influenza from wild birds through the introduction of an avian influenza prevention zone in October 2022, requiring all bird keepers to follow strict biosecurity measures and continues to remind keepers of these obligations. The Scottish Government and its operational partners have a robust control strategy in place and a proven track record in dealing effectively and rapidly with controlling outbreaks. Sanders Kulhani. Sanders 
I think we, I think we may have lost uh, Dr. Gulhani's uh, connection. I called uh, brief supplementaries firstly from Paul McLennan, please. Thank you. Um, this is an understandably boring time for poultry farmers and all those keeping birds. Scotland continues to be guided by the science, so can I ask the Cabinet Secretary to reiterate what the CVO has previously said on biosecurity? As given the key role it has to play, this cannot be repeated enough. Cabinet Secretary. I, I thank the member for raising that point because he is absolutely right. I think getting those measures out, uh, that message out about biosecurity, we really cannot stress enough just how important those measures are. The scientific opinion that we have from uh, EFSA concludes that housing birds gives a twofold reduction in risk, but that's only effective if there are other good biosecurity measures in place. Uh, but we do know that through adopting that high biosecurity, that gives a predicted 44-fold reduction in cases. Housing of birds that are normally kept in a free range way also has consequences for the welfare of birds, which we also can't forget about. And we also have to remember that even if birds are housed, that's not a panacea uh, against the, the disease and the spread of the disease. So I really would invite all members of the chamber to support the Chief Veterinary Officer in sharing those vital biosecurity measures to their constituents. We appear still not to have a connection with Dr Gulhani, so a brief supplementary Beatrice Wishart. Thanks, Presiding Officer. Uh, the spread of avian flu has had a dramatic impact on seabird populations, and Shetland is no exception. Moosa Nature Reserve is famous for its population of breeding European storm petrels. The island was closed to the public last August to help prevent the spread of avian flu. Nature Scott was to carry out a risk assessment review and report back in March 2023. Can the Cabinet Secretary provide an update on progress with that review? Cabinet Secretary. Uh, firstly, I mean, it is obviously devastating to see uh, the impact that avian influenza has had on our wild bird populations. Uh, the, the member is, of course, right in, uh, in what she's saying about the work that's being undertaken by Nature Scott. But I'd be happy to write to her and provide more of an update as to where that work is at the moment. Thank you. Question number four is withdrawn. Question number five, Graham Day. Thank you. Uh, to ask the Scottish Government when it last engaged with the UK Government regarding the reported impact on farmers in Scotland whose livestock may be exposed to animal diseases as a result of delays to the introduction of post-Brexit border controls for checking meat and other products entering the country. Cabinet Secretary. The Scottish Government shares the members' concerns and takes disease prevention and control very seriously. As the UK Government continues to develop its new border controls target operating model, we constantly emphasise that these controls must be based on veterinary and plant health expertise. And we regret that we weren't consulted when the UK Government took the unilateral decision to postpone the previously planned introduction of import controls last year. We continue to bring in safeguarding measures whenever appropriate to maintain our high biosecurity standards. And Scotland's Chief Veterinary Officer is an active participant in the UK-wide Animal Disease Policy Group. I will, of course, be stressing this point when I meet with the UK Minister of State, Lord Benyon, on the 30th of January. Graham Day. Thank you, the Minister for, uh, Cabinet Secretary, for the answer. In the view of the NAFUS, and I quote, amongst all the chaos of securing a Brexit deal, the mechanics of how border controls would operate were somehow lost. A reference, of course, to the UK government kicking the can down the road last April. Now, while we sit in limbo, the threat of African swine fever has become of particular concern to our pig farmers. So can I ask, does the Cabinet Secretary share my dismay at how the Tories and the Brexit they forced on us has left the agricultural sector exposed in this way? Cabinet Secretary. I, I would agree with the member and the African swine fever in particular that he mentions is a concern and it is a, a very real threat. But not only that, right now we have a situation where our producers and businesses in Scotland have that unlevel playing field. So we see importers with the, the freedom to bring their goods to the UK, but our exporters have had the barriers of checks since day one. And not only is this a competitive disadvantage, which we know has impacted and is continuing to impact businesses here. But it does pose that very real risk when it comes to our biosecurity. I did raise this with the UK Government in a letter to Lord Frost actually way back in September 21, where I'd stated that the difficulties which have led to the, this decision are due entirely to the UK Government's reckless approach to exit from the European Union, which is being shown repeatedly to have been done without that responsible planning or coordination. And the results of that are clear. We have the inconsistency and constant change and delay, incurring unnecessary costs, resource difficulties and delays across the economy and across our communities. Question number six, Daniel Johnson.
to ask the Scottish Government what it will be doing in the coming year to help farmers mitigate any impacts of rising costs in the sector. Cabinet Secretary. The Scottish Government has committed to measures worth almost £3 billion this year as a whole to help with the cost crisis. Farmers and crofters will benefit from some of the general measures that we have set out, both as individuals and as a sector. But in relation to this sector in particular, we announced in June last year that farm payment dates would be brought forward to as early in the year as was practically possible in order to try and provide that support to businesses with immediate cash flow, which we know was a challenge. We have delivered on this commitment, with over 17,250 businesses having already benefited from this change, with around 439 and a half million pounds paid out to date. Daniel Johnson. I thank the Cabinet Secretary for that answer. We are in the midst of a cost of living crisis, which in turn is a cost of business crisis, which is a cost of farming crisis. The, the rising cost of fertiliser and fuel are well documented, but just in the last week it was announced that soy prices, soy being a major constituent of animal feed, have risen to £100 per tonne. In addition, we have uh, issues such as new and second-hand tractor prices increasing by around 30 to 40 percent. And can I just say, as a member of Edinburgh Southern, I'm surprised to find myself raising tractor prices in Parliament. But can I ask the Scottish uh, Government what steps it's taking to both monitor these costs and what contingencies is it looking at so it can step in and prevent farmers in vital parts of the agricultural sector from going under uh, from unforeseen rises in Cabinet Secretary. Well, first of all, we absolutely would not want to see that happen. We have a number of ways in which we monitor this ongoing situation. So the member will no doubt be aware that I established a food security and supply task force last year. Uh, it was a short life task force and produced a number of recommendations towards the end of June last year. We did agree to have another further two meetings just to continue in that monitoring capacity to also ensure that we were delivering on those recommendations. We had one meeting towards the end of last year and we're looking to set up that second meeting shortly where no doubt we'll be going to discuss some of, these, uh, some of these key issues that the sector is facing at the moment. There is also a monitoring group at uh, UK level two. Uh, we had the interministerial group with the UK government and the other devolved administrations just at the start of this week where we were looking at the outcome of that and discussed the importance of sharing, of collecting and sharing that data uh, between the different administrations too. So I would just want to assure the member and assure those across the chamber that we are continuing to monitor this and to see what support uh, we can provide where that's necessary. But of course, I would again highlight that not all of this falls within the remit of the Scottish Government, but where we can help, we are always striving to do that. And two brief supplementaries. First, Siobhan Brown. Thank you, uh, Deputy Presiding Officer. There was someone who could have made a really big difference to farmers in terms of mitigating costs, and that was the Chancellor. Instead, the UK Government decided that farming businesses businesses should be classified as non-high energy businesses. Does the Cabinet Secretary agree with me that the Tories have shown us all what they think of our farmers and our food security by this decision? As briefly as possible, Cabinet Secretary. Well, just to say that I am, of course, aware that energy costs are a serious issue, and I know it is causing a great deal of concern right across the sector. Of course, energy pricing itself is reserved, and we have repeatedly called on the UK Government to clarify how businesses, especially SMEs, such as our farmers and crofters, are going to be supported uh, through the energy crisis from April after the energy bill relief scheme ends. But unfortunately, we are still waiting on those answers. And briefly, Emma Harper. Thank you, President Officer. In addition to the increasing costs on farmers associated with the cost of living crisis and Brexit, farmers also experience attacks on their livestock by out-of-control dogs, which has a financial and emotional impact. So, would the Cabinet Secretary join me in encouraging all dog owners to ensure they are following the Scottish Outdoor Access Code? And will she agree to meet with me to discuss how we can further publicise the Dogs Protection of Livestock Amendment Scotland Act, which I took forward in the last session? Again, as briefly as possible, Cabinet Secretary. I, I just want to thank the member for again highlighting the legislation that she brought through the Parliament in the last session because it is really important. And we now have penalties that I think reflect the seriousness uh, of sheep worrying uh, because that we know that this is a significant, uh, a significant issue in rural areas. Uh, so I would be happy to meet with the member to discuss this further and to see what more we can do collectively to build that awareness. Thank you. Question number seven, Michael Mann. To ask the Scottish Government what steps it is taking to curb the recently reported outbreak of squirrel pox. Minister Lorna Slater. 
We have had outbreaks of squirrel pox, a virus that affects mainly red squirrels, in various parts of Scotland since 2005. I am aware of the local outbreak reported near Lockerbie and through the Saving Scotland's Red Squirrels Partnership. Action is being taken to tackle the spread of the virus. This includes targeted grey squirrel control, encouraging the public to report sightings of infected animals and asking them to remove and clean feeders to minimise transmission. Where we have had outbreaks in the past, targeted grey squirrel control has ensured that local red squirrel populations have successfully recovered. Michael Mara. Thank the Minister for that response. You'll know well the importance of ensuring the diversity of species across the country and across our natural world. And my home city of Dundee and neighbouring Angus have a long history in trying to preserve a red squirrel population. I would appreciate uh, any reassurances the Minister can give that she will continue to monitor the situation and report back on any further outbreaks. I thank the member very much for the question and have really encouraged local uh, enthusiasm for red squirrels and for biodiversity in general. Fortunately, the virus has currently only been reported in the south of Scotland, which is one of the Saving Scotland's Red Squirrels Partnership's key priority areas. So far, there have not been any cases of squirrel pox detected in red squirrels on the Highland Line or elsewhere. To make sure that this remains the case, the teams are engaged in strategic squirrel pox sampling of red and grey squirrels. When their virus is detected in a grey squirrel in the area, the teams deploy a rapid response monitoring and control protocol. Briefly, Audrey Nicholl. Thank you, Presiding Officer. The recent reporting of squirrel pox in the borders is indeed a cause for concern. The 2022 Great Scottish Squirrel Survey has shown that concerted efforts in Aberdeen uh, have been very successful, with red squirrels returning and the grey squirrel population significantly decreasing. Will the Cabinet Secretary join me in commending the efforts of those who have worked to preserve this iconic Scottish species in the North East? Cabinet Secretary. Oh, to Minister. <laughs> I, thank, I thank the member uh, both for the promotion and uh, for raising this point. I recognise the hard work and perseverance of those working to support the survival of our iconic red squirrel. The dedicated work of those involved in the Saving Scotland's Red Squirrel project, particularly the Grey Squirrel Control Officers, has been vital in protecting the Highland line. This has ensured that the red squirrel population in the Highlands remains safe and free of grey squirrels and squirrel pox. And I thank them for this and for protecting our native biodiversity. Thank you and apologies again, Minister. Question number eight, Annabelle Ewing. Thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the Scottish Government whether it will provide an update on the aquaculture culture regulatory framework. I welcome the independent regulatory review of aquaculture consenting last year, announcing an immediate change to the validity period of new marine licences for shellfish and fish farms from 6 to 25 years. I established and chair the Scottish Aquaculture Council to ensure progress across all of our commitments, which includes progress of the regulatory review, in addition to delivery of the actions set out in our response to the Salmon Interactions Working Group report and a new vision for sustainable aquaculture. I'm pleased to inform you that members can keep up to date with developments at the Scottish Aquaculture Council on the Scottish Government's website. And recent activities include establishing a dedicated consenting task group to explore and pilot new ways of working in the consenting process. And the Scottish Science Advisory Council is currently considering the use and communication of science in the fish farm consenting process. And I look forward to receiving the conclusions of that project this spring. Annabelle Ewing. I, I thank the Cabinet Secretary for her answer and presiding officer the Cabinet Secretary will be aware of the importance of the salmon industry to my constituency with 600 jobs based at Maui in Rasai. So could I ask the Cabinet Secretary therefore uh, to advise as to how much more time is to elapse before the full implementation of the Greggs report and what the reason is for the near one year delay in doing so and whether SEPA has in fact been supportive of this process or otherwise. Cabinet Secretary. I mean, well, firstly, I would just want to, to recognise, and the Scottish Government recognises, the importance of aquaculture to the members' constituency and, of course, a, a, a number of constituencies right across Scotland. It's an important sector to our economy and we remain committed to the sustainable development of it. And that applies not just to where farms are located, but also that wider supply chain and the jobs that the sector supports, uh, including the jobs in the members' constituency. I would want to emphasise, though, that there 
there hasn't been a, a year-long delay, and I would hope from my initial answer uh, the member would recognise that a number of pieces of work have been initiated and are currently underway. We always knew the timescales that had been put forward in the Greg's review were going to be really challenging to meet, but of course we wanted to make sure we hit the ground running and we got started. We have made significant progress since that report was published, again with the establishment of the Scottish Aquaculture Council, the consenting task force, and I would just want to assure the member and of course other members across the chamber that SEPA is of course fully engaged with us on this journey and is a positive and active member of both groups and we really want to and we will continue with this momentum to ensure that we deliver a fit for purpose consenting system for aquaculture as soon as possible. Two supplementaries. It would be good if they were brief. Likewise, the responses. First, Edward Mountain. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. And I refer, refer members to my register of interest in the wild salmon fishery. In 2018, the former Rec Committee published its salmon farming report. There were 65 recommendations, and it's clear the industry is not improving. Fish farm mortalities increased to a high of 29,000 tonnes last year. If you were to put them all in lorries, you'd have a nose to tail queue from here to Edinburgh Airport and beyond of rotting fish. Mortalities are unacceptably Question, please, high. Mr. Does the Cabinet Secretary agree and what's she going to do about it? Cabinet Secretary. Again, I would say the action that we're taking right across the piece on the back of the, the Greg's review, a number of recommendations from that that we're making progress on. And I would also outline that we have made significant progress since the publication of those reviews that have been done as well. But I'd be happy to write to the member with more detail on that and to outline all the progress that's been made in that time. And Mark Ruskell. Thank you. Um, instead of dredging for kelp, there is now a growing interest in sustainable cultivation, but the sector would benefit from a robust independent regulatory framework, as was recommended in the aquaculture process review. Um, so can I ask the Cabinet Secretary what progress has been made in establishing this framework for a kelp farming industry? Cabinet Secretary. Yes, well, of course, one of the first steps we said that we would do is publish our vision for, uh, for aquaculture and that industry. I think it is a really exciting and burgeoning industry and we obviously want to make sure that we see the sustainable development of that and that we get the, the regulation for that right. So what I would say that the first step will be the publication of that vision and then we'll take forward further work from there. Thank you, Cabinet Secretary. That concludes portfolio questions on rural affairs and islands. I'll uh, allow a brief pause while front benches change. And the next portfolio is health and social care. Again, if members wish to ask a supplementary question, I invite them to press the request to speak buttons during the relevant question. Um, again, quite a bit of interest, so I'd appreciate brief uh, questions and as brief responses as possible from the ministerial team. Question number one is from Evelyn Tweed. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. To ask the Scottish Government what steps it is taking to reduce the avoidable harms associated with drugs and alcohol. Cabinet Secretary. Presiding Officer, we have a, a range of activity underway to reduce harms from drugs and alcohol. This includes a national drugs mission specifically to save and improve lives, focused on early intervention and prevention, whilst also improving the quality and access to treatment. And this was set out in the cross-government plan published on 12th of January. Furthermore, our national alcohol framework sets out our national prevention aims on alcohol. This includes evaluation of our world-leading minimum unit pricing policy and our alcohol marketing consultation currently open to responses. These activities are aimed at reducing consumption and minimising alcohol-related harm. Evelyn Tweed. Health inequalities are a feature of alcohol-specific deaths. Deaths attributed to alcohol are 5.6 times as likely in the most deprived areas of Scotland compared to the, most, the least deprived areas. What ste steps is the Scottish Government taking within its powers to tackle the root causes of health inequalities and the disproportionate impact alcohol has? 
Minister Angela Conson. Mr. Officer, Ms. Tweed is uh, right to highlight the social gradient of alcohol harms. Uh, Ms. Todd will, of course, continue to lead the work on minimum unit pricing and the consultation to restrict alcohol advertising and promotion. Uh, this is crucial work to change in Scotland's troubled relationship with alcohol. Much of the work I lead in the Drugs Policy National Mission has a direct bearing on improving the quality and access uh, to alcohol treatment, for example, expansion of residential rehabilitation, supporting families, tackling stigma and trauma. However, to overcome the wider root causes of health inequalities, the Government is, for example, investing £4 billion in social security, including the extension of the Scottish Child Payment to £25 uh, per child per week for eligible families and this financial year an additional £3 billion to help uh, households faced with the UK's cost of living crisis, a billion pounds of which provides uh, services and support not available um, anywhere else in the UK. And brief supplementaries first, Hugh Webber. Thank you. SNP and Green Ministers approved a cut of £1 million to the alcohol and drugs budget in November. Yet over 100 families in November last year were grieving the loss of a loved one because of drugs and my thoughts and condolences are with these families. The SNP have stated it's a national mission to tackle this, but you cannot say it and mean it and then cut funding. Frontline services are key to saving lives. Will the Minister commit to reversing the cuts to the alcohol and drug budget to ensure these services are fully supported to tackle this ongoing crisis? Minister. Signing officer, the draft 23-24 budget uh, for substance use overall is at 160 million. Uh, that is an increase from 146.5 million. That includes investment in health boards, uh, investment in the crossover between addictions and mental health, and crucially for the alcohol and drugs budget, uh, which is proposed at 99 million pounds, an increase. Yeah. Uh, from £85.4 uh, million. Pounds. And while, of course, people can look at the, the budget uh, line by line, but the overall budget is increasing. And, of course, the synergy between the work I do in drugs policy and alcohol is very important. For example, the £100 million pounds over the lifetime of this Parliament to be invested in residential rehabilitation and aftercare will benefit as many people with alcohol problems as drug problems. And briefly, Paula Kane. Presenting officer, uh, on Monday, public Public Health Scotland published its Rapid Action Drugs Alert and Response Quarterly Report. It confirmed tragically an increase in the number of suspected drug deaths in October and November of 2022, an increase of 20 per cent compared with the same month in the previous year. Every single one of uh, these deaths preventable, each one a tragedy. Can I ask what action the Minister is taking in response to these figures to ensure that we are making significantly faster progress, particularly on the implementation of MAT standards? As briefly as possible, Minister. Siding officer, part of the national mission was to uh, publish uh, more data, more information, more quickly so services could uh, respond on the ground. Public Health Scotland have issued an alert around a new substance called nitazine. Um, suspected drug deaths over the first nine months of last year have went down, uh, but the member is correct to say there has been an increase over um, October, November. It is still too early uh, to say whether that, that uh, there is a direct link between nitazine and suspected um, drug deaths increase um, in October. In terms of the information and action that has been undertaken, the uh, alert has been issued to drug and alcohol services, emergency services, healthcare and high-risk settings. It has underlined the ongoing importance of naloxone uh, in, in terms of effective uh, treatment, uh, along with uh, good harm reduction advice. There is also a warning on counterfeit medication uh, in and around not to take oxycodone tablets uh, and unless they are prescribed uh, by a, a medical person. And there is also the importance um, of outreach facilities, which is part of the implementation of MART. Um, but Public Health Scotland uh, have been engaging directly with the areas where there have been detections. And question number two, Carol Mochan. Okay, presiding officer, to ask the Scottish Government what its response is to the reports that some women have been denied transvaginal ultrasounds on the basis of not yet being sexually active. Mr Marito. Uh, as stated by the Royal College of Obstetricians and Gynaecologists, no one should 
ever be denied access to health care on the grounds of virginity. Specific guidance on trans transvaginal ultrasounds has been produced by the British Medical Ultrasound Society, which all NHS boards are encouraged to adopt. And as set out in their guidance, if a patient has not had penetrative sex, they are still entitled to be offered a transvaginal ultrasound in the same way that cervical screening is offered to all eligible patients, regardless of whether they have had penetrative sex. Not yet being sexually active should have no bearing on clinical decision making around access to diagnostic scans. Carol Mochan. Thank you. I thank the Minister for that answer. And as you say, it is critical that no one is denied access to vital health care on the basis of not being sexually active. And although a number of report, reported cases of this happening in Scotland is low, eh, one is too many. Therefore, can I ask the Minister if she would commit today to ensuring that the guidance notes provided um, for practising and future doctors regarding transvaginal ultrasounds are clear in saying that women are, 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 who are not sexually active are eligible for procedures to allow everyone to have the best opportunity to detect abnormalities. Minister. I am um, certainly happy to commit to that and I am more than happy to work with the member if she wants to contact me or write to me with more details of ideas of ways that we can ensure that that message goes out loud and clear. Um, I would say I will take the opportunity given it is Cervical Cancer Awareness Week to re reiterate that point though that cervical screening is routinely offered to, to all eligible patients. This is one of many gynaecological myths which persist to the modern day that um, you, know, you don't need to have a cervical smear if you, haven't ha if you aren't sexually active. The, the cervical smear is offered to all eligible patients regardless of whether they have had penetrative sex. And I thank the member for the opportunity to reaffirm um, that in the chamber today. Thank you. Question number three, Rona Mackay. Thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the Scottish Government whether it will provide an update on the number of hospice beds available in NHS Greater Glasgow and Clyde area. Minister Marie Todd. Uh, NHS Greater Glasgow and Clyde has a total of 38 hospice beds across the health board area. It is the responsibility of integrated joint boards to plan and commission palliative and end of care services, end of, end of life care services, in using the integrated budget under their control. And so it is a matter for health and social care partnerships working with NHS boards and independent hospices. I thank the Minister for that answer. Um, last week I met with a GP in my constituency who raised concerns over hospice beds in NHS GGC, with patients being admitted to the acute hospital sector due to a lack of beds. After a discussion with one hospice, it was suggested that some of the capacity issues seem to relate to ongoing COVID restrictions. Can the Minister confirm what restrictions are in place uh, that could be affecting capacity issues and if there are plans for these to be removed? Minister. Um, I thank the member for that follow-up question. It's fair to say that our NHS is experiencing immense pressure at the moment, and that means there's been a redoubling of our efforts across the board. There's been a, a power of work going on to ensure that patients can access the right care at the right time, as close to home as possible. With regards to COVID-19 measures, the continued transition to national infection prevention and control um, IPC guidance sees a return to service user placement based on assessment of risk alongside the application of routine standard infection control precautions um, and transmission-based precautions in line with the pre-pandemic IPC practices. But some pandemic measures do, however, remain. These are subject to continuous review. This guidance remains in place for a large number of community-based services, including for hospices um, for the whole of Scotland. And as part of our work in developing a new palliative and end-of-life care strategy for Scotland, we will seek to ensure that people ensure palliative of care wherever and whenever it is needed. And to that end, we're mapping services and support right across Scotland, delivered through hospitals, through community settings, including in people's own homes and care homes, and also in hospitals. Question number four, Christine Graham. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer, to ask the Scottish Government when it last spoke to NHS Lothian and NHS Borders. Cabinet Secretary. Uh, both uh, ministers and government officials meet regularly with the leadership of all NHS boards, including NHS Lothian uh, and Borders, to discuss matters of importance. It won't be a surprise at all to the member that the most recent discussions have centred around the challenging winter pressures. Uh, Rafe Roberts, uh, the Chief Executive of NHS Borders, uh, was on the most recent Scottish Government Resilience Call, chaired by the First Minister last week, uh, in his role as Chair of Chief Executives. Christine Graham. 
I thank the Cabinet Secretary for his answer. The Cabinet Secretary will be aware that in November last year, NHS Borders launched a single point of contact cancer hub for people referred to the Borders General Hospital with a suspected cancer diagnosis. This was to provide support and information and to relieve some of the stress. This is, uh, can I ask, therefore, it's being phased in into, for everybody, it's just being phased in just now, but everybody should have access that requires it by spring of 2023. Like me, does he welcome this initiative? We'd like to comment on it. Uh, well, I do, I do welcome uh, the initiative. I think it, it, all of us as members across uh, the, the, the chamber, uh, whether we have personal experience of going through a cancer journey or know somebody who has, or a constituent perhaps, we all know that one of the common feedback points of feedback we get is that uh, they are uh, often feel that they are passion pillar to post and they want that single point of contact to help navigate what is a, a very difficult time uh, in, in, in their lives. So you know, this is a, a key action. In fact, this uh, particular initiative is one of our key actions uh, as part of the current uh, flat, uh, national uh, cancer plan. And, and as I say, it will remain an important part of our new cancer strategy, which is due to be published uh, in spring. So I commend the NHS Borders and the other boards uh, who have the, special, uh, the, the single point of contact cancer hub uh, in place. And we'll look to roll them out nationally, as the member says. Question number five, Jackie Bailey. To ask the Scottish Government when non-urgent elective operations will resume in NHS Greater Glasgow and Clyde. Cabinet Secretary. I have been clear that boards can and they should take the steps necessary to prioritise and protect critical and life-saving care if that is deemed necessary. Local health boards and healthcare professionals, local clinicians, they are of course best placed to judge what reasonable measures should be taken in each board area to manage those very severe pressures. Like other boards, NHS Greater Glasgow and Clyde have taken the decision to pause non-urgent elective procedures to ensure those with urgent health care needs, uh, including cancer needs, are prioritised. Uh, this decision was not taken lightly. It is under constant review. Uh, I spoke today to, to senior management uh, from NHS Greater Glasgow and Clyde, and they reassured me that this is something they are monitoring uh, daily. Uh, and I expect boards where there has been an impact on non-urgent elective operations that these are resumed as soon as possible. Jackie Bailey. Can I thank the Cabinet Secretary for that response? In NHS Greater Glasgow and Clyde, there is something like 11,000 patients waiting over a year and nearly 2,000 waiting over two years for elective surgery, an increase of almost 50 per cent since you took office. But can the Cabinet Secretary perhaps offer clarification on whether urgent and day case surgery is still going ahead in Glasgow? Because I know of patients who have had urgent procedures cancelled at the last minute. And given that day surgery doesn't require overnight beds, can he explain what's going on? Cabinet Secretary. Uh, well, again, it is uh, the pausing of non-urgent elective surgery. Now, if uh, Jackie Bailey or any other member in this uh, parliament has cases uh, that are deemed urgent and they have been cancelled, then of course I'm happy to raise them with the health board. Equally, of course, Jackie Bailey, I know, can raise them uh, herself and she will get an explanation of why uh, those uh, particular elective procedures were cancelled. So it is non-urgent uh, elective uh, care uh, that is uh, cancelled in terms of outpatients as well. Uh, of course, uh, this is a decision, again, taken locally. We spoke about this uh, today with Greater Glasgow and Clyde. The ability to free up beds, the ability to free up staff can be very important to be able to relocate them to busy sites uh, and busy wards uh, such as those in Glasgow, uh, Greater Glasgow uh, and Clyde. But, but I want to give an absolute assurance to Jackie Bailey uh, and indeed other members that have got similar concerns, not just about Greater Glasgow and Clyde, but other health boards who have made similar decisions that this will not be in place for a minute, a second longer than it has to be. It is under very daily review, uh, under daily review, and I'm happy for Jackie Bailey to pass on any individual concerns, constituents and concerns she's got to me. I'm happy to raise them with the health board. Question six, Colette Stevenson. Thank you, President Officer. To ask the Scottish Government whether it will provide uh, an update on Scotland's trainee doctor workforce. Cabinet Secretary. Uh, trainee doctors account for approximately 42 per cent of all doctors and hospitals, uh, and therefore they play a major role uh, in service de delivery. And I am grateful uh, to them for all the work that they have done, uh, particularly throughout the course of the last few years. Uh, the number of doctors in training is up over 24 per cent under this government, uh, or 1,295.6 whole time uh, equivalents. Uh, the recruitment of trainee doctors in 2022 was the most successful to date, with 1,073 posts filled. Uh, more broadly, we are continuing to implement recommendations that form part of the 48-hour maximum working week without averaging for junior doctors in Scotland, expert working group report. Colette Stevenson. I thank the Cabinet Secretary for that response. In 2011, junior doctor Lauren Connolly from East Kilbride 
tragically died driving home from work. Since then, her father, Brian Conley, has been campaigning to reduce junior doctors' working hours to make them safe. And I'm grateful to Hamza Yusuf for meeting with us last year. Could the Health Secretary provide an update on the work being done <coughs> to make the working hours of junior doctors safe? And does he agree with Mr Conley and me that junior doctors should have a maximum 48-hour working week without averaging, which the First Minister committed to work towards in 2017? Cabinet Secretary. Uh, can I thank uh, Colette Stevenson for such an important uh, question and can I uh, once, again, once again pay tribute to, to Mr Connolly, to, to Brian Connolly for um, in continuing uh, to campaign tirelessly to improve working conditions for the medical uh, workforce. Uh, he has gone through the most unimaginable tragedy uh, but is making sure that he is campaigning uh, day in and day out uh, with, with us, uh, in, in relation to, to advocating with his local MSP or directly with government um, to, to, to ensure that working conditions are improved for the medical uh, workforce. And over the last year, the Scottish Government has worked in partnership with junior doctors and partnership with employers uh, to restrict the consecutive days of long shifts. So those are shifts that are greater than 10 hours. And we've reduced those or limited those to, to, to four in any seven days uh, for junior doctors. Uh, progress continues to be made on implementing uh, the broader recommendations of the expert uh, group, including improvement to facilities Rota design and staff governments. In respect to the specific question on a 48-hour week uh, without averaging for junior doctors, I, I do remain committed uh, and the government remains committed uh, to pursuing uh, that goal. I would say to Colette Stevenson, it is a, a longer-term uh, issue that we're seeking to address. Achieving 48-hour working week will be a process which requires a careful consideration uh, to ensure we get this right uh, and make lasting improvements for the working conditions uh, of our junior doctor workforce. Please supplementary, Paul Sweeney. Thank you, Mr Deputy Presiding Officer. I'm grateful to the Cabinet Secretary for sharing those details on Trinity Doctors in Scotland, but he will know that there are extensive marketing and recruitment campaigns being carried out by Australia and New Zealand targeted at Trinity Doctors working in Scotland's NHS, exacerbated by a lack of available specialist training posts and general burnout due to high working hours. So you could advise us what proactive steps the Government is taking to retain those doctors once they are completing their foundation training and why he sees these doctors as being such an easy target. As briefly as possible, Cabinet Secretary. Oh, well, can I say, uh, Paul Sweeney is of course right to, to raise this issue. Well, first and foremost, for our trainee doctors, we're making sure that we're creating the training places necessary for them here. So we've increased those uh, by an additional 725 places, 152 of them uh, just agreed recently and will be recruited in 2023. Uh, what, what we'll also seek to do is to try to make the improvements that I've outlined to Colette Stevenson so their working conditions are improved, and I think that will help to retain them. Uh, and on top of that, of course, we'll continue to discuss uh, with junior doctors and the medical workforce more generally, what we can do around pay, around pensions, to make sure that we retain them here in Scotland, as opposed to lose them elsewhere. Question number seven, Beatrice Wishart. Ask the Scottish Government what discussions it is having with NHS Shetland to address waiting times for NHS dentistry and orthodontic treatment. Minister Marie Todd. The Scottish Government continues to meet regularly with NHS Shetland to review all aspects of the board's service delivery. Current areas of focus for dental and orthodontic treatment include addressing waiting times in the context of the board's response to COVID-19. In addition, the board is developing an improvement plan for dental service provision, which is due to be concluded in the coming months. Beatrice Wishart. There are continuing and long-term issues for people in Shetland trying to access NHS dental services. My 16-year-old constituent is on a waiting list to join an orthodontic waiting list, and she says, and I quote, I was told that I needed a brace when I was 10, so I've been waiting for six years with a sense of insecurity. They were confirmed as a priority case and have been waiting indefinitely to start treatment. This delay in treatment could have lifelong impacts on my constituent's dental health. I am in dialogue with the Minister about this specific case, but does she think that such delays in treatment are acceptable? Minister. So first of all, let me say um, I understand the challenging position facing NHS Shetland with respect to orth orthodontic treatment. And in certain areas across Scotland, NHS dental access is undoubtedly challenging. In many cases, that's been exacerbated by Brexit controls as well as the unique difficulties following the pandemic. Now, in, with regards to this um, specific case, I can reassure the member that the board has recently taken a number of successful mitigating actions to improve the provision of specialist orthodontic services 
That includes the recruitment of new specialist, a new specialist orthodontic consultant who has additional capacity at weekends. Provisional assessment by the board suggests that the service is now seeing substantially increased numbers of patients compared to what was previously seen. And the board are also currently in a recruitment process to replace other clinical staff, and we understand that's looking very positive. There are other mitigating uh, actions um, on the way, including additional training, in particular the prospect of remote training for orthodontic therapists. Now, with regard to the individual case that the member raises, um, I understand that the board adopted a new model for prioritising patients, which was communicated to patients in October 22. All patients on the waiting list have been fully informed of the current situation. The immediate priority in terms of catch-up is for the patients who are currently under treatment. And on completion of that cohort of patients, the service will focus on those patients um, waiting for treatment. I understand that that's disappointing for the constituent that she mentions, and it does fall below the standard of service that we would um, hope for, but undoubtedly the service has been um, as, as has um, all, all our dental services have been um, challenged by the pandemic, and I'm glad to see that it's an improving situation. Um, I must say also the board. Minister, very... I'm going to have to. I've got a couple of supplementaries, um, oh, and I'm okay, keen to take okay. them in. First, Jamie Halker Johnson. It needs to be brief. Uh, too many dental practices across Scotland are going private or closing down completely. And next month, Sky and Lacalche Dental Practice will close its doors for good. Has the, cab has the Minister made any assessment of the impact their cuts to NHS dent dentistry will have on the rural dentist practices? And how will she um, expect dental practices across Scotland to provide NHS service at a loss now that crucial, crucial funding has been withdrawn? Minister. So um, let me reiterate, as I have done previously in the Chamber, that this Government um, provided um, an enormous amount of um, funding to sustain the NHS dentistry during the pandemic, a period of time during which they couldn't operate at all and without that government funding would have gone completely under. We're now working with the dental sector to review and reform um, dental payments and our intention is that there will be a more sustainable model um, going forward. Um, I have to say from the Conservative um, member to, to mention the challenges across the industry without mentioning uh, the word Brexit, I think, is, an, uh, is a, serious, a serious omission. Because if, if like me, you visit, if, if like me, the member visits, if, if like me, Minister, could you? If, like me, the member were to visit um, any dental practice in Scotland, almost, and certainly many of them, what you will, f what you will find is that European dentists are no longer able to come here and sustain our workforce, our, our workforce in Scotland as they previously did. Right, I'm going to take question eight, but the responses are going to have to be briefer. Richard Leonard. Uh, to ask the Scottish Government what its response is to the report Leave No One Behind from the Health Foundation. Cabinet Secretary. This is a sobering report. It is deeply concerning that in 2019 there was a 24-year gap in healthy life expectancy between people living in the most and least socio-economically deprived 10% uh, of, of, of localities. And we know one of the driving forces and reasons uh, for that is, of course, the impact of uh, conservative austerity on public services. That's why we're using all our powers and resources available to us to create a fairer Scotland. Richard Leonard. Uh, can I thank the Cabinet Secretary for that answer? Infant mortality in the most deprived areas, two and a half times that in the least deprived areas. People living in the poorest households, almost eight times as likely to report poor health as those living in the richest households. Life expectancy, already the lowest of the UK nations for the last 70 years, not going up, but coming down even before the pandemic. Health inequalities are rooted in wealth inequalities. Wealth inequalities are rooted in class inequalities. Does the SNP government have any plan, any strategy, any idea whatsoever for tackling the inequalities identified in this report, which at their root are based on the divisions of economic and social class? Cabinet Secretary. Uh, can I say to uh, Richard uh, Leonard that I don't disagree with him that the public... Uh, the, the cost crisis that we see, the Conservatives, of course, who are the architects of that cost crisis, is a public health crisis. And that is why we are committing £19 billion to services, to NHS and social care services over the next year. The Conservatives might well laugh at a cost crisis and public health crisis, but they do well to listen uh, to the points that we make here. That's why we're providing £4 billion in social security and welfare payments. 
uh, over the next financial year, and that is why we are extending the Scottish Child Payment to families uh, with uh, eligible under-16s and increasing it, of course, as he knows, to £25 per week per child. So we'll continue uh, to make the necessary investments uh, focused and, and, and absolutely focused on uh, those in the, least, in the most deprived uh, areas. But what I would say to Richard Leonard is uh, that, as, as opposed to you know, leaving those powers in the hands uh, of the Conservatives, who are the architects of the cost crisis, it wouldn't be much better to have all of the financial levers here in this Parliament. Thank you, Cabinet Secretary. That concludes portfolio questions. Um, time is tight. We are going to move straight on to the next item of business.